Unfortunately, here in New Zealand, um, you know, we say that doctors are, are very rare, Pacific doctors. It's more rarer to have Pacific policy advisors because it's, it, it's, it, it, there's not many. Uh, it's the most rarest positions in government is the number of Pacific policy advisors. Because how policies are made is basically like this. Politicians will tell the government departments, here, yeah, we want this done. Then the bureaucrats, or well, the policy advisors, and they go and develop it. Now, how they develop it is based on their lens, how they see the world. And if they've never been to South Auckland, then I bet you they'll be developing it for Epsom. Malo Lele, Pacific Greetings, and welcome to another session of uh, a diary of an island scholar. Uh, I have my a wonderful guest here, a good mate, uh, a scholar himself, and uh, a person who's uh, done his service to the community and now living his good life. Dr. Tony Whakahau, good to have you here, mate, and uh, be a part of the podcast. Thanks, Noa, And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to you if you can just Introduce yourself, where you're from, and in, in, in the kingdom, just in case you might have some relatives out there, sure. and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Doc, for this. Um, <clears throat> I haven't done one of these for a long time, but um, yeah, it's a it's an honour to uh, to be here and uh, share a little bit about my journey. Uh, so my name is my real name is Pauliasi Fakahau. Um, I'm Got a bit of Fijian in me, so I was named after my Fijian grand uncle. My mum, my dad is from uh, Falaha, and my mother is from Afanga and uh, Hasini. So um, that's where I'm from. We came to New Zealand when I was about <clears throat> four years old. Mm. So I was part of the Dawn Raids era. Um, I think we got here about 1977. And um, yeah, that's, that's a bit of, oh, I'm in the... Part of the church. I don't go to church, but uh, yeah, I'm a just Tonga Daina boy, Free Church of Tonga. So um, yeah, that's mm. about that's me. Awesome. Four years, four years old when you uh, arrived to Aotearoa from from the kingdom. Uh, very young and still adapting to a, a new society, and then you're going through the whole dawn raid uh, events. Do you yeah. have any memory? Oh yeah. It was funny because um, about two weeks ago, I I drove um, around my old neighbourhood where we first lived, and it was in um, Ellerslie Highway. And there's uh they've got a, they've got these hotels or well, motels there, um, the Ellerslie Highway Motel. But at the back is where we first lived, and then moved around some of those other flats there. So I actually drove around just to have a look. Because it remind, I remember those were the places where my parents would um, would run, you know, will take us, will go and hide in one flat, while the immigration and the police will, you know, you know the Tongans call it hua or, mm. or you know search while they were searching for um, the overstays. So yeah, it was it was interesting. Those were dark days, mm. you know, difficult days, but. Um, you know, I what I do remember is when I first landed here, is seeing those uh, two cent coins, one cent coins in there, and they were throwing them around. And the first thing I did was crawl around and pick all those little coins up. <laughs> you know, I came, you know, coming from the from the village, mm. you know, and then land here, and to see that, and then uh, and then to go to the supermarket and see, you know, how the fruits. You know, and the, you know just how how much how there was plenty of stuff here mm. that we weren't used to. So yeah, I was quite a shock. Your schooling days, um, <clears throat> which primary, intermediate, and secondary school did you attend? Yeah, my, I first went to um, Ellerslie Primary School. Um, back in those days, there was you know before they developed Ellerslie, Ellerslie was like the was a big Pacific community, Tongans, Samoans, uh, and Māori community all around the area. And we lived across from Ellerslie Primary School, uh, Kaumia Street. 
So I went to uh, LSD primary, and then uh, my parents got a state house in Glen Innes, so we shifted to Glen Innes, where I went to a school there called Raw Potaka. Um, and then after that, I went from there to Tamaki College, the, the, the famous Tamaki College, for two years. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think my parents knew that I was a bit naughty at the time. So the best thing for them to do was to send me to Wisley College uh, from 87 to, you know, to 89. So that was my schooling days mm. yeah, before I moved on to uni. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and fun fact to everyone, just in case you think um, Pacific Communities is South Auckland based, uh, in fact, back in the 1980s, 1990s, a lot of the Pacific, but particularly the Tongans, dominated uh, Onehanga, Royal Oak, Ellerslie, and also Panmure. So that's where a lot of our people resided before moving, uh, moving down south to what we call home, uh, also known as South Auckland. Wesley College. Yeah. The the school that uh, your parents shifted you to because of as you mentioned you back in your your behavioural days uh, why the move to Weasley oh uh, <clears throat> you know because at Tamaki College I, I started um, not attending school um, I started uh, doing the uh, bukeloi thing you know telling them I'm sick and then go to school just to have my lunch there was a lot of places you can hide back, in, uh, you know, um, where we were living. So, um, but the teachers saw that I had a little bit of potential. Like we had about, or they put all the uh, Pacific, back in those days, you know, they called us all the islanders. They put all the islanders in one class. And the class that I was in, uh, most of them are older than me because, you know, they came through during the visa-free period. Um, and... I managed to do all right, you know, and I, you know, I, I never used to. I used to figure out that if I could study hard the day before the exams, um, I should be able to do okay. Mm. But I did all right. I actually beat the, you know, came first in the class, mind you. It, it was the worst third form <laughs> and fourth form class in the whole um, school, so it wasn't that hard to to, to get um, first place. Um, and then after that, when my parents saw that, I had a little bit of potential, um, but if it wasn't honed properly, I could end up being like my friends. That's when the glue, um, back in those days, there was sniffing glue, mm. and we had the bop, you know, we had this thing called the bop, rap just started coming in a little bit. So they said, right, let's, uh, and, and the funny thing was, they never knew anything about Wesley College, but one day, we went over to that area to uh, get some firewood. In front of Wesley College back in those days, there used to be these massive old pine trees. So my parents and my uncles used to go there quite a bit to get the firewood, you know, um, because it was there for free. And they keep looking at the sign, oh, you know, all the time keep looking at it. And then one of my old teachers at um, Tamaki College told me about it and said, why don't you go and drive up? Next time you're going to get fire, we'll drive up. So we did. And from there we found out, you know, it's a boarding school. It's good for naughty boys. So, um, yeah, that's what happened. Uh, following year, my parents said, right, you, no more farm work for you because I then started doing farm work. They sent me to go do farm work. That's hard work, man. It, it, I've, you know, I've, I've never experienced hard work until working on the farm during the holidays from school because um, we needed some extra money. And um, once my parents said, okay, you, you can go to Wesley and that way you won't have to do any more farm work during school holidays, mm. I was gone. Mm. That's that's how I ended up at Wesley, bro. <laughs> Good times, eh? Good times. Um, <clears throat> some of the some key highlights. <laughs> what, what, what did you really enjoy about the school? Yeah, they, they kind of, you know, if I was to reframe it, how has the school sh- shaped you to become the person that you are today? Yeah, I think it was eye opening for me because um, the, when I went to the school, <clears throat> they had a lot of the uh, no uh, nobilities kids there. I had no idea about you know this type of stuff and that part of the Tongan culture. Um, there was a lot of culture in there. 
um, and also religion was a big part. They opened my eyes up uh, to that. Um, and it was at this one event we went to. Um, we we went on the school van to this event here the Tongans had, and I didn't know that the three of the um, students with us were all um, nobility uh, noble sons. So they were, and, and two of them were the king's um, nephews. So when we got there, um, and of course wearing that uniform, you know, the panda uniform, it just took, I came from a school of Tamaki College where I had no socks and, um, you know, I was struggling just to get some grey uh, gray uniform to go to Wesley where you're wearing these uniforms where you look really smart. Um, and then those, those other things added on to it. So when we went to that Tongan function, they took us after the, the, the church service to the hall and we ate before everybody else because the king's nephews were there. That's when it opened my eyes. I was going, wow, we're special. This is a special place. So, yeah, I, I think it helped me. Uh, from there, I, I started concentrating, saying, hang on, you know, this. my parents spent a lot of money at the school. I should make use of what it's got. It helped me hone my skills in terms of study because you have to study, you know, in the evenings it's always homework um, and also it's quite disciplined. So those good things. I mean, mm. Wizzy's not that great in other parts, you know, as you've heard in the news lately, but, mm. you know, during my time there, there was stuff there that I've managed to grapple onto and help me get some direction in my life. Mm. So, yeah, besides the rugby, of course, mm. you know. I wasn't that great a rugby player, but um, yeah, I was a first five. Yeah, <laughs> I was first a terrible. Five. I was a terrible first five. <laughs> <laughs> Just in uh, your favorite subject, what was your favorite subject back <clears throat> in school? My my favorite subject at school was economics, and the reason why I, I loved economics be, was because it spoke to me, you know, because it, you know, it's it's a um, the first thing the teacher taught me was, you know, we don't, you know, about scarcity. And I, I quickly understood about economics, you know. That's the whole reason why we have economics is because because there's not enough stuff in the world for us. But economics will help us to allocate those things more efficiently. Um, there'll be opportunity costs and so forth. But it's also, it's like an art form. So it's a bit like how people um, try and work out the weather. It's a bit like economics. Right, you know, you 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 got the saying. An economist always has two hands. It means oh, I could be this, or it could be that, mm. but both answers are correct. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's right. That that was my favorite subject, economics. Right. And, and you carried that on to university. Yes, carried it on to university. When I went to Lincoln University, uh, nineteen ninety, I finished working on the farm. After during the school holidays on the twentieth of February, nineteen ninety, uh, we were picking um, a buttercup. So you know, we call it in Tongan tahina. Those buttercup is like five kilos each. So I used to come back to school after each farming season with arms that were like um, you know, like a bodybuilder's arms from picking the sp- uh, the pumpkin and throwing it, and. I got on the ground on the 20th of February, I think it was 6 o'clock on a Saturday, kissed the ground and said, and my uncles and and, and parents were going, well, what is he doing? I kissed the ground and then I said, this is the last time I'm ever going to do this, you know, and if I ever have any kids, I'm never going to allow them to do this because it's just so hard. Um, So, and then on the 22nd, I flew out from Auckland Mm. to Christchurch to start my education at Lincoln University doing uh, BCom. Amazing. Mm. So that's a friendly reminder to you, to our young people, to if you you really want to turn your life around, turn back and say to that thing or whatever it was that was holding you back, never again, I'm coming back to you. Hey, good reminder. And it's a a Mm. motivating uh, factor for us to, to turn back, eh? Yeah, because you know when you when you're in despair, like I found it, like 
I was hardly getting any money from it because remember in the Tongan family situation, you 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 have to work for your parents anyway because we got church kavengas and all that. So when you're working during those holidays, all the rich kids or the better off kids are all, you know, enjoying the beaches or going to dances. We were out working on the farm every day. And I remember I used to looking up. The thing with the farmers is if it rains, there'll be no farm work. So I used to look around during the day and I hope, oh, I hope it's cloudy. You know, I used to pray sometimes, oh, I hope it's cloudy or where's the rain, you know. And But, of course, it's summer, so it never is. And then I remember about 12 midday when you're right in the middle of the field. It's so hot. Your back is sore from bending over. You just want to drop down and have a sleep or, or rest. But you can't. You have to work as a group, so you got to keep going. And then you'll see a cloud, you know. And I'm going, oh, I wonder if that cloud has got some rain in it. Please come this way. Please come this way. <laughs> so all those things, eh, you know. So, but farm work really, you know, gives you some direction and really helps you think because we did squash, uh, which is pumpkins. We also did um, potatoes. Uh, we did carrots. And onions, onions were the worst because you've you've you can't get the smell off you for the whole week. And I remember when we used to come out, come back from farming, and go back into the city, here into Auckland. All the all the girl, you know, I was I was a young boy back then, and all the girls that I liked used to hate us because I smelled like onions all the time. <laughs> so there you go, um, kids, you know. They try and learn. So what I did was is to think about that, and I thought, all right, whatever I'm going to do from here, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to do something where my kids mm. won't have to follow what I went through. That's right. Mm. Amazing. No, amazing work. If you're just tuning in, welcome to the Diary of an Island Scholar. Our guest here, Dr. Tony Fagahau, uh, also known as Bauriasi, um, who is our guest for today. Um and sharing some insights of his upbringing. I'm going to take a turn here, uh, and I really want to acknowledge and, and, and your, your your parents um, for the hard work and sacrifices, not only migrating to this very cold country, uh, but also laying the foundation for you and your siblings to um, to grow and, and, and prosper here in New Zealand. There's a camera right over here looking right at you. And I want you to think about your, you know, standing behind those cameras are your parents. And if you had the opportunity to say anything to them, what would you say? Yeah, my my, my dad's passed away, but my mum's mm. still around, uh, alive. But, yeah, I'd like to say thank you for um, getting us here, you know, the sacrifices. Before we moved to New Zealand, my dad... Um, Worked at this place called Glassworks Industries, and um, you know he had to bring up my little sister on mm-hmm. his own. But just to get us here, you know, the foresight and the sacrifice, because I knew they won't have a good life um, like we did, like what I did. But I like to say to my parents, you know, thank you, and and I promised, and the promise I made my dad is that you know we're going to make the most of it. Mm. And we'll never forget um, to make sure that his legacy continues and that he won't be disappointed in us, you know. Maybe he'll be disappointed in me, but my, but the kids, the grandkids will will be fine. Yeah, Amazing. And, and that's pretty much our journeys, mm. you know, mm. that we, we always have to. And that's why I like in the Māori proverb, when you walk backwards to the future, mm. you know, we've actually got to acknowledge the past. Mm. Uh, and which has shaped us to become the people we are moving to the future. So, uh, you know, rest in peace to your, to your beloved father. And also I'm pretty sure your mom is super proud of mm. not just your achievements, but also with your, your grandchildren as well uh, and your and your kids. Pa- uh, post-university, mm. uh, you went, then you go into the workforce. Mm-hmm. What was your yeah. first job? So post-university, I um, – you know, your first job out of university is always the hardest. And my first job out of university was um, making um, – I couldn't get a proper job in government. I was still applying. Um, so I came out 
and I, I, I did a bachelor's and then I did a master's. But while I was waiting, doing the interviews, my first job out was working for this um, fisheries company. Once again, I sort of went back to doing what I was doing, working in the farm, but this one was a, it was a labouring job. And it was scooping up um, the oil from shark's liver. And that job, it was this place called um, uh, uh, Rock something, or uh, Rock Lobster uh, was the name of the place. So I was working there because uh, I, I, I had a family at the time. <clears throat> and um, shark's liver, they used to give it, you know, they used to bring it to the place and, and um, it was more disgusting than the onions, really, because you have to put the, you have to put the, the liver inside these bins, put it out in the sun, and then you have to wait for the oil to come to the top, and then you scoop it. Um, it's not a nice job, it's, it, it, but that oil is what they use to make perfume. So it's, very, it's a valuable um, product. Unfortunately, someone has to scoop up the oil but it stuck to your your hands, <laughs> your clothes and everything. So I was doing that for about, about a month. Then I just couldn't handle the smell anymore. So then I went and worked for a, a yoga factory. I was, yeah, I remember looking at the supervisor at the time and he was earning something like uh, $10 or something an hour. And I was going, man, I hope I can earn that. That's a lot of money back then. Um, fortunately, I, I had a good interview at Stats New Zealand. So I went into work for Stats News. They offered me a job as an economic statistician, which is, you know, in my field. So I became the first Tongan um, economic statistician. I think I was one of the – actually, I was one of the – I was the first Tongan mm. to work for Stats New Zealand, Statistics New Zealand in Christchurch. Um, and down there they had, they had the branch for national accounts. So national accounts, their job is to work out – how much the you know the country makes uh, in a year, and to work out GDP and and all of that. So, my specific role was to work on gross fixed capital formation, and what that is is basically all the big capital stuff like ships, planes, you know, big buildings, whatever. Is to add all of that up, is to work what that is, and that is added on to the rest of the you know, what we make in New Zealand to to calculate GDP. So every time a big, uh, at the time, we had the big uh, um, frigates, New Zealand warships will come in, te mana, te kaha. You know, they were like half a billion dollars, you know. The economy will go up and my name will be up there a little bit. So I was looking forward to it. I said, like, ooh, I got my name in there a little bit because, of course, you got to calculate it. Mm. Right? So that's my first job, working for Stats New Zealand. And then um, second job after that was I, I shifted to Wellington office. F- if you're going to work in government, I, I figured out you have to go to Wellington. So I moved, made the move, decided to make the move to Wellington and through Stats New Zealand to another part in the Labour division. And then the, after that, I then figured out that policy is probably where I want to go. So I started... Uh, with policy going in through the Ministry of Pacific uh, Island Affairs back in those days. Then I went from there to, uh, and then I figured out that in order to get a higher salary, I'd go to Māori, <laughs> to, to Puni Kokiri, Ministry of Māori Affairs, because <laughs> basically they were paying double the price. So yeah, I went there. Then after that, I moved around. I, Well, actually, after that, I decided, right, I'm going to actually make more, more money if I become a contractor and then just shift it around to different departments, becoming a contractor in policy. Mm. Yeah. Amazing, so, eh? Mm. Amazing to leave university with a BCom mm. and then <clears throat> go into a very humbling job. Yep. They're scooping oil from mm. a shark's level. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then find your dream job, really. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then you know, navigate yourself until you mm. find the perfect position. Um, it's it's very rare for our Pacific people to to jump, eh? mm. and like how you've jumped from stats to MPIA to to Puna Kukuri and mm. to any you know other other roles that you've gone through. Um, 
other than other than money, what was some of the um, the learning yeah. that you've you've gained from jumping sectors? What I found was, um, especially for for Pacific, and, and the same goes with Māori, if you're going to influence um, government uh, policy and decision making, you have to be there as part of the the dis- decision making, but also in how you develop things. And this, there's a thing that, you know, we call machinery of government, how it works and how it operates. It's based around policy. Unfortunately, here in New Zealand, um, you know, we say that doctors are, are very rare, Pacific doctors. It's more rarer to have Pacific policy advisors because it's, it, it's, it, it, there's not many. Uh, it's the most rarest positions in government is the number of Pacific policy advisors. Because how policies are made is basically like this. Politicians will tell the government departments, here, yeah, we want this done. Then the bureaucrats, or well, the policy advisors, and they go and develop it. Now, how they develop it is based on their lens, how they see the world. And if they've never been to South Auckland, then I bet you they'll be developing it for Epsom. You know, and those areas. But the, the the sad thing about it is that the application of it will be for the whole nation that will also impact our people without making adjustments or changes. So those are things that I did learn. But probably one of the, the more important things was I I I did a um I managed to get a, a stint in Tonga. And that was probably the most exciting part of my the work I did. Um at the time Tonga Tonga was going through some issues, mm. and um, I was contractor. I was a contractor in Wellington at the time for one of the big departments, and then an opportunity came up to go solo to Tonga. <clears throat> and basically, the Tongan government at the time they were, you know, they didn't have a lot of cash, a lot of money, mm. and they were looking for some support. So um, I joined another group here. We went over. And our solution for Tonga was, maybe you need GST. <laughs> Look, and, and and that has a lot to do with my PhD mm-hmm. afterwards, right? But back then, in 2005, I was across with a team from Wellington to introduce GST to Tonga. They call it, uh, it's a consumption tax. So GST is basically a value-added tax, right? So, because I did a stint at the IRD, so I knew about it. So... We went over, taught the, the, the community, the, 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 the businesses, um, and also the government about how this will work because the way in which the tax system was being run in Tonga was diabolical. Um, but we tried, we made sure that they'll have a good system. Mm. Um, and instead of relying on income taxes and also taxes at the wharf, like customs, duty, and all that, just use um, uh, consumption tax or, or GST. So they went from having, you know, their revenue at the time was something like 18 million. They went from 18 million, and then when we introduced uh, GST or consumption tax, they went up to about 120 million. So, you know, the, you know, we were the flavor of the month, you know. Mm. Um, they loved it. They enjoyed it. And, and, and Tonga still continues to run mm. with that system. So that's when I got back to Tonga, learned a lot. I learned a lot how to deal in Tonga and – and how important is that? That that respect is very important. No matter mm. how whether you have got qualifications or whatever, yeah, I, I do. You know, I do see a lot of young people go back there and struggle. But you know, if you just follow a few key things, just keep quiet, listen, watch who's around first before you start doing stuff. Because you know, the Tongans are very. That's how we are mm. but anyway that, that was probably the key thing I did in Tonga um, and a bunch of other stuff and that I wouldn't want to put on camera at the moment mm-hmm. but anyway no, awesome it's, it's uh, um, and, and for those who are tuning in um, policy hey, is the uh, if you want to make a change if you want to make a shift uh, for um, for families communities policy is the way to go through uh, and to make that make that change at a very strategic level so to our young people tuning in um, if you ever want to get into, um, you know, to the public sector, get into policy advising and uh, make a change that way. There was a, there's a famous quote made by um, Lord Marval, 
Dame Winnie Laban, and she says, um, gone are the days we, uh, we are on the menu. We now need to be sitting at the table. Uh, and the table is where decisions are, are made, not on the menu. So uh, get on, you know, acknowledge the work that you've done, not just here in New Zealand, but also the uh, groundbreaking change in Tonga, which still owes millions to China. Uh, <clears throat> Which I hope you can try to shift that as well. Eh? <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, I'll tell you the story. You know, while, while, while I was there, Tonga has never had, uh, um, they ne- they've never had any uh, protests, big ones, mm. and so forth. The moment we introduced it, we had the farmers marching with their tractors. They brought all their tractors onto Parliament. Um, Nick Minute. We then had um, the public servant strike, and they were just outside where they placed us was in the you know one of the little um, buildings next to this park where the protesters were. I used to listen and hear them going, "Oh, who are these people in that that house? You know that 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 building. We should smash them first because I think they're the, those consultants from New Zealand." And then after that, the following year. Um, once GST was fully implemented, they had the rights, and um, my car that they allocated me because all, all all government cars in Tonga has got a P on it. My car was one of the first ones that they upended, and <laughs> I've still got photos of it. So, yeah, policy can go both ways; it can yeah. work, but if you write the wrong policies, you know, it could really harm the the vulnerable communities, and people right. will come. You know, will 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 um. You know, they'll they'll protest. Mm. Yeah. And and for those who who are tuning in, if you really want to, and you know, Tony mentioned earlier that if you really want to make a change based on your lens, and if you don't have the lens of the community that you want to serve, actually go immerse yourself into the community and get a taste of what the community is going through, and then you can write up a policy based on that lens instead of just making an assumption based on what you see on the media, and which happens a lot of the time. So. Uh, um, I'm glad that you're still alive, and uh, you know, although your car got smacked up, but uh, <laughs> you made it safely back to Aotearoa. Yeah. Now you're part of the riots here. <laughs> yeah. um, PhD, and you, you touched on it, yeah. uh, the journey into the PhD. Uh, why Why the topic? Yeah, well, you know, I remember if I go back in terms of my story, mm. money wasn't – you know, my parents, we were a poor family. We never, money was never a big, you know, we didn't have a lot. Um, so I'm never, even to this day, I'm never comfortable with the wealth gap between the rich and the poor. You know, if it was up to me, everyone would just have the same, you know, similar. Um, but I just see the big gaps that open up between, yeah, but so... When I went to Tonga and implemented GST, I then saw, at the time, we never got the, we never did, you know, go out and actually talk to those who were going to be the most impacted on. And those would have been the, the, the poor. The poor, when policies and big changes are made, they don't have a voice. They just go and buy, you know, goods from the store, not knowing that a decision has already been made and the price has gone up. They haven't had a say in it. Um, if you're rich, you have a choice. You can say, oh, actually, I might buy bulk and save money or I could actually, I'll go overseas or do something. The poor, they're stuck with what they got. And it just means that it just get, gets worse and worse for them in terms of their well-being. Mm. So when I came back um, from Tonga, I, I gave it a lot of thought. And then I'm, I've always been... Um, a big fan of Prof- Dame Professor Marilyn Waring. I first came across her when I was working for Statistics New Zealand, you know, in the in the uh, mid nineties. And if you, if those who who don't know um, Marilyn Waring, she's one of the most famous women in the world because of her, you know, her work for uh, on feminism, but also on women ethnicities and, you know, looks after those who can't, who can't speak for themselves. But how the statistics system works 
in the world is that the measure of how our country does so well is on the monetary value of what you produce. And and that's what we've been using, you know, how to measure whether New Zealand's doing well. Well, Maryland, you know, was the first one that actually turned it around, flipped it on its head and said, hang on, what about, you know, women's unpaid work? What about unpaid work? Women who look after, you know, uh, the family, you know, the men can't just go work and who's going to look after the kids? That work has a value. And also volunteer work, mm. that also has a value. Community work, that also has a value. Cultural stuff, that has a value. You can't just value the monetary stuff and say this is how much or how rich or how how good a country is doing. So I read that back in the mid-90s and then – I met Marilyn in, again in 2008 when I came back from Tonga at a conference. And um, I presented to her <laughs> on GST and uh, I tried to say, oh, you know, this is, look how good they're doing. But she posed this question. She said, yes, have you spoken to those who are the most vulnerable and those who have impacted on? I couldn't answer that. And then her and I had a good chat about it, and then she said, maybe you should do more work on it. And, yeah. That's how I started thinking about the PhD. And also, it was a um, an, a promise that I made to my father. Before my dad died, one of the things he said to me was, son, I want you to finish your study, uh, because I had kids before um, before I finished my studies. So I did make a promise to him before he died. So... I think it all came together at the right time. And then I went and did some work in the NGO sector. It didn't work out. I don't think it was for me. And then came back into government in 2017. And then, um, yeah, started. And that's why I met um, uh, Dr. Edmund here. <laughs> um, we started on that journey. And it was an eye-opener for me because um, when I remember – you know, the, the two uh, main academics that had a big influence on my study um, was um, uh, Tangaloa, Peggy Fairburn, Professor um, Tangaloa, uh, Peggy Fairburn. She was awesome. And um, uh, Dame Professor Marilyn Waring. You know, those two, um, if, if it wasn't for them, well, I don't think I would have finished it, mm. you know. So, oh, good yeah. job. Well done. And, uh, mm. Again, congratulations on reaching the pinnacle and making that dream come true for mm. you, for your father, eh? mm. um, and also your the family. Mm. And as as you know, in our Tongan culture, and also in, in many uh, many Pacific cultures, uh, reaching the the pinnacle is of education is is the dream and aspiration of our parents who migrated to this country. So, for those who want to do a PhD, um, do it seriously. Um, Time will fly. The support systems are are amazing that are already put in place at the moment. So um, there's no, you know, the only thing that we can control is a time. And if um, once you have the time, you can. I think everyone should do um, some sort of study and further the education as well. So in terms of um, advice for for our students who who may be pursuing PhDs, uh, what what you know if you had a couple of of advices, what would you give? To Trying to enjoy it, I reckon. I think, you know, uh, you know, maybe I was a little bit biased, but coming back into studying after so many years, I, I was actually so amazed because during my time, when I was doing a, a postgrad in the 90s, to get an article, it took me three months because we, we used to write to England and ask them to send an article by a book or, 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 or photocopies. Now it's all in front of you, you know. It's in you know, press of a button, really, um, and just the amount of support, like you were saying, um, that students get now, and the peer support around you is a lot stronger. And I think for for those who are in, who, who want to do it, make use of it. And you know those groups that we used to have those we used to have those Pacific um, uh, groups, and then we had the potluck groups. Um, make use of them because each group adds value to what you're doing. Um, and 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 the other thing is, 
the timetable, you just got to make sure you stick to your timetable. Um, don't be, you know, don't be um, too worried that, oh, am I heading in the right direction or, or whatever. If you do more than enough uh, research, you know, it'll come to you, mm. you know, it's in there. So, yeah, that that's probably it. But but enjoy it. You make the most of it because you, you're not going to be there forever. One day you're going to miss being a student. <laughs> and I actually still miss it and I wish I can go back and do it again. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, asks why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um Last last one, bro. Uh, mm. And I know you have um, you have children, mm. and also uh, a growing list of your grandchildren mm. as well. Um, this is a perfect opportunity for for you. One day, you know, we won't be here, mm. um, but this podcast will, and it will hopefully they'll stumble across it. Eh? Yeah, if they have the opportunity to just stumble up upon our Dalano today, and you had a message for them, this camera, what would you say to them? Mm. Yeah, um, one of my daughters is a doctor now. She's at, um, uh, she's training to be an orthopedic surgeon. This is a message for you, Charlotte. Continue, and I want you with your kids too to follow what you're doing. Um, for me, doing health is important because you're helping people, um, and also, you know, keep it going. It, you know, I think health is such a, a, a honourable, noble. Um, you know, um, thing to do because you're helping people, you're helping save lives. Also, to my other daughter, she's at Otago too. She's going, she's training to be a doctor. So, Tans, keep going. Make sure the grandkids, they follow you too. And to my other son who's going to go to Otago in two years, I expect you to be going following your sister's two son and the grandkids. So, yeah, and to the rest of my grandkids and, and my kids, you know, be, a, be good people, mm. be good people, and money is an everything. So I think I expect that you will all help our people better themselves in the future. Be happy. Good job, Doctor Fagaho. Thank you so much for your for sharing and reflecting on your journey. Um, it's not every now and then we sit back and, and see how far we've come, but also how far we need to go. So uh, again, on behalf of the the team here and also. Uh, the podcast, uh, Malo Apito, and uh, all the best. And uh, remember, for those who are tuning in, um, this is the Kava Master. And so, if you ever want to drink Kava, hit me up and I'll hit you up with uh, Dr. Fagahau, and he will give you the premium Kava in the Pacific. Other than that, stay calm, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Kia ora.